Good morning, everyone. Hello, Tigers. Welcome to the first in our personal finance uh, series, uh, Learning Together. Uh, I'm uh, Bob Shear, and I'm proud to serve as dean of our Nidorf School of Business here at Trinity University. And today's webinar on budgeting and spending is part of our six-part series on financial literacy scheduled for the first quarter from June to August. I want to thank our Office of uh, Alumni Relations and Mr. Uh, Salim Sharif for putting this program together and for inviting the other guests to the series over the next several months. Uh, now, it's my distinct pleasure to present today's webinar speaker, a good friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Cyro Gutierrez, who's from the class of 2005, graduate of our Michael Nidorf School of Business. Uh, Cyro serves currently as Senior Vice President at Bank of America, and he also teaches for us as an adjunct uh, professor of finance. He teaches, of course, personal finance, which is a very popular course for our Nidorf School of Business. Uh, that course is attended not only by business majors, but majors from throughout the campus. Uh, Cyro also serves as our member, uh, member of our Business Advisory Council in the School of Business, which works with us on our curriculum. Uh, fundraising, and also on um, our strategic direction in the school. So, Cyro, welcome today. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. Yeah. Well, when we build our dreams for a successful life, one of the fundamental requirements is to plan and manage our personal finances well. We all need to learn the essentials, and our speaker, Cyro, will walk us through and offer his valuable expert advice along the way today. You'll learn, among other things, methods best practices, and the psychology behind and involving budgeting and spending. Uh, my plan is to engage our speaker in conversation, kind of like we're in our living rooms, with a series of questions. This should enable him to cover all of the important points he'd like to share with you today. After that, we'll open the floor uh, for audience questions, and that'll be our format. So as you listen to the conversation, if any questions for the speaker occur to you, Please submit them using the Q&A tab. I hope people can find that. We'll uh, not use the chat for receiving questions, but look on, on the bottom of your screen and you'll see the Q&A tab. And feel free, I will read the questions anonymously, so uh, no names uh, to be used, but please add them as we go through. If something really, really hits you or you want a little more clarification, Syra will, be, will address those towards the end. We're gonna finish promptly <laughs> at 11 o'clock, so we'll keep things on schedule. And Cyro, are you ready to go? Yep, sounds good, let's do this. All right, so here's my first question for you. How would you describe the psychology of money? How would you describe the psychology of money? I'm not even sure I know what that is. <laughs> uh, good question. So first off, let me go back and also say, again, what a treat it is to be in front of all the Trinity Tigers out there. If you would have told me 20 years ago that I would be here talking to uh, all of you fine Trinity alum, I probably wouldn't have believed it. So uh, it's an honor to be here. So thank you. So psychology of money. All right. So think of like right now as it's just a moment of time as it is. And time is this long continuum, right? And so on one side of this continuum is the future. It's things that have yet to happen. And then on the other side of the continuum is everything that has happened before in the past. Everything that's happened before in the past really has shaped you as you stand like right here at this moment in time. And so there's this term called money scripts in personal finance. And money scripts are these unconscious beliefs that happen that are rooted in your childhood, rooted in your past, rooted in behaviors that, that you know, you've experienced before in the past. And they, they shape you how you look at money today. And so when we think about the psychology of money, it's all of these the stuff that's happened in the past that you know makes you think about like this is the way I feel about money as I think about the future. So money scripts can be anything like money makes me feel better, right? Or uh, I don't deserve money, or money will give me more life, give my life more meaning. Um, it could be really good, it can be really bad. It it, it is it, it just it, it's different per individual. And I think it's really important that we understand our own personal money scripts before we even dive into anything when it comes to money. Yeah, and Sarah, in your class, in the personal finance class, I don't know, 
what well, usually have what 25, 30 students in there. I know it's very popular, one of our larger classes that we have. Um, how do you introduce the topic of money scripts? How do how do you how do you teach with that that concept? Yeah, so so I in the class it's been really a treat. So I've been I think this will be my eighth semester teaching this coming semester, and I really use my life as a pedestal to it all. Um, I share this uh, the, the scripts of what happened in my life, and then how I became uh, more aware of how money scripts are really important into my my life, my wife's life, and then I just tell them that journey. So. For me, uh, my wife and I met at Trinity, uh, so both of us are Trinity alums. And um, you know, I was the I was a saver, and she was a spender. Um, <laughs> we, we got we got married in two thousand and eight, and I remember the day that she told me um, how much debt that she had when it comes to um, credit cards. I remember the day uh, we just started calculating on a spreadsheet how much debt. We racked up in student loans, uh, the furniture that we bought without really thinking about money, the car that we bought. And I mean, even right now, just thinking about it and talking about it, um, you know, I, I just, it's like a feeling of I wanted to have a heart attack. My, my heart just started racing more and more. And it, it was a, it was, there was a class that we took at a local church, a Dave Ramsey class. And the Dave Ramsey uh, class, it, it was, um, uh, it, it wasn't for us the, the theories that that they projected, but what it was for from Candace and myself, Candace, my wife, is there was these different topics that we chatted about, um, you know, throughout the entire course, and it allowed us to you know bring ourselves together on each individual topic. And before we got to that point, though, uh, we realized that we were uncovering all these previous thoughts that we had in our past, like. You know, my dad handled money this way. My my grandpa did this. My wife's uncle did this. And, and these shaped our behaviors as we thought about each of these particular subjects, right? So long story short, like we decided that we were, uh, we, we, we figured out what our theories were, like our, like our family theories, and then we progressed forward. And we set a goal. And that goal was, we were going to pay off the two hundred thousand dollars in debt that we had. Yeah, two hundred thousand in debt that we had wow. at the time. Wow. I was thirty years old. And, and that's so, Sarah, Cyro. That was from student student loans and just just life getting started kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, student loans was over fifty percent. Um, yes, it was. Uh, you know, the furniture we bought, the cars that we bought, etc. So we um, we started telling friends about our journey as we were going along down this path. And as we were telling friends about our journey, we realized, and they always wanted to sit down and they wanted to chat at the coffee table and, you know, talk about what they're trying to do with their money. And, you know, we met from teachers to HR professionals to policemen, all of them had their different stories of too much credit card debt, too much student loans. They've never saved a penny. They, they wanted the latest technology. And before we could go forward with any of our conversations, I said, well, why do you think that? Right? I mean, why do you, why do you think you need to have the latest technology? Why, you know, why is that important to you? Um, why did you get all this student loan uh, debt? Like, why do you feel like you have to have the, these latest cars? And, and we, unless you address these concerns and these feelings, you really can't move forward. So um, we, I, I realized the importance as I was talking to other folks uh, and friends that like, this, is, this is important for them. Um, so now going back to your question, right? Like, so for the class, I tell the students the same exact thing. I tell them, all right, each one of us comes with a different background or different beliefs. And none of them are good or bad. They just are. And But you need to realize what your psychology is, like what, where your beliefs are about money before you can even go forward. So what we do, and I love this. I mean, this is my favorite thing to do in the class. It's like the first class that we have. We have this discussion and it's, you know, it's very hypothetical, very psychological, right? And there, you could see the wheels turning and you could see their, their thought process going like, what did my dad tell me <laughs> uh, back as I was growing up? Like, what did uh, grandma think about this? Mm -hmm. and, I tell, and, and also it's the first day. So I don't know mm -hmm. the students, right? Like, I don't know them from Tom to Jill or what. And <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not really good with names. So I tell them, here's what you got to do. Send me a video. And it can't be long because I'm only an adjunct professor, man. I don't got much time. I got three kids at home. Got to be three to five, 
three to five minutes long. And I want you to tell me about yourself, why you chose Trinity, what your major is, what do you like to do with your free time? And then what are your top three to five money scripts? And it is so cool to hear their stories, um, uh, you know, what their beliefs are about money. Because the way I, I, I look at it and the way I tell them, this is their foundation, right? You can't build a house without having a solid foundation. So they need to understand what they're working with, with that foundation. And then from there, we, we layer in the next layer of a foundation, which is budgeting and, you know, getting it to the personal balance sheet, et cetera. But um, anyways, and then after that, we go into building like these life events that would occur no matter what in their life. So buying a car, buying a house, insurance, taxes, I mean, all that stuff, having kids, getting married. Um, and so all that is layered on top of, you know, you know the foundation of the, the money scripts. End of the year comes around and I always ask them, like, you know, so go back to the beginning with your money scripts, which you came in to this class with. How do you feel about them now? What are your new money scripts? And, and know that we've modified them uh, just by this one semester course. And um, anyways, it's really cool to see the progression in their thought process uh, as, as, they, as they think about money and, and, and the future of money. Pretty, pretty neat. Pretty neat. And I just want to want to follow up on that budgeting question, but I just want to say thanks to uh, one of our alums who sent us a good morning message and also, we have the mom of um, a rising sophomore who's participating with us. So thanks to her for being here as well. And thanks for, for having your daughter at Trinity University. Uh, Cyro, let's kind of segue a bit. You were talking just at the end about budgeting. What are some of the ways that, that people can budget? What Are there different methods? I mean, is it just kind of cut and dry? What, what, what do you recommend? How do you approach that? Yeah, so, um, so the budgeting gets a bad rap. Uh, uh, it's hard. It's not fun. It's like, it's like when you look in the mirror and you realize, all right, I'm, I'm overweight or right. I mean, no one likes to, to have that realization in front of you, especially at the very beginning when you've never had to do this before in the past. So budgeting can be really, really hard. So, so let me start off by saying that too. There's a, there's a handful of different, uh, I guess, popular methods to budgeting and then there's hundreds of offshoots to it so but there's three primary ones that um that you know a lot of these offshoots are off of the one is a zero balance budget and so this is where you list all of your expenses by categories and then you um you 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 track all of them by categories and you set a targeted amount per category so food um entertainment um uh housing and then you you wind up like comparing yourself month to month. Now, the, the the positive to a zero balance budgeting is that you have uh, it's a lot of I mean it's it's a lot of work, but you realize so much about how you spend your money. You have a better understanding of where every penny goes. And I mean, again, you're looking straight in the mirror and you're you're seeing every fault, and then you modify that. The downside is that it's so much work. It is so much work. It takes hours on the front end and then it takes a couple of months to perfect it um but like again once you get it down then you, you're you're in really really good shape the second more popular methods is this envelope method which was made popular by dave ramsey and so what it really what that is is basically you get your paycheck you know the 15th so tomorrow's the 15th you get your paycheck you go to the bank you cash it and then with that cash you you have different envelopes and each of the envelopes have different categories. So, you know, here's my restaurant envelope. Here's my fun envelope. Uh, here's my, um, you know, house envelope. And once the money's gone out of that envelope, you can't spend it anymore, right? And, and the positive to that is you physically see, I mean, you see where your money is going. And that has a powerful effect on your mind. The downside of that, though, as you could probably imagine, is, I mean, you're carrying cash everywhere. I mean, who wants to carry uh, cash everywhere you go? The third popular method it was made uh, popular by Senator Elizabeth Warren before she was a senator. She was a personal finance whiz. And she had this thing called the 50-30-20 rule, where 50% of your money goes towards basic needs. So housing, utilities, phone, 30% um, goes to fun things like vacation, 
restaurants, clothes, and then 20% um, goes towards your future, right? So um, I can go into, you know, uh, I guess a little bit later, I guess we'll go into a little bit more specifics, but those are the three primary ones when it comes to budgeting. Okay. And, and Cyro, how do you, how do you choose the right? Do you choose the envelope? Do you choose the 50, 30 yeah. program? Uh, what, I mean, what criteria would you use to, or what I use when preparing my own personal budget, uh, are there certain considerations, certain? Right. Yeah. So I, I would say that there's no, uh, there's no right answer overall. I mean, I think anyone who says this is the way that it's going to be, then um, they're biased, obviously, right? Each individual has their own needs. And so there is no right or wrong answer. That's what I tell uh, the students. And that's what I'll tell the folks here that are that's watching this webinar. Um, I think the, the primary thing to think about is what are you trying to achieve? You know, what's your end state? Um, you know, I mean, were you, are you trying to save a million dollars? Are you trying to, to save up for retirement? Um, are you trying to leave a legacy for your kids? Um, are you trying to buy the latest pair of shoes? I mean, like it just really all depends on what you're trying to achieve. And then based upon what you're trying to achieve, uh, you look at your lifestyle habits and what are what's more comfortable for you at this particular moment and time. And then from there, I think you can make the best decision on which one is is you know is, is best for you at that you know juncture in your life. Okay. Yeah. But just a little abs- my own personal observation. My grandfather uh, had his own method of budgeting. He just carried around a big wad of cash in his pocket, and I think yeah. that was from growing up in the Depression era. And uh, <laughs> And, and was afraid to, to leave it anywhere. So he budgeted day to day as he, as he moved ahead and did pretty well. I want to, I want to just, just kind of, uh, I'm looking here at our question board and I, I, there's a question here that I think is relevant. Uh, I know it's relevant for what we're talking about right now on budgeting. And one of our, our participants asked, where would debt be allocated under the 50, 30, 20 approach? Yeah. Debt would be allocated more towards, um, uh, your future, right? Like, you know, what are you trying to pay off in the future? I could also make the argument it's under like your basic uh, living expenses as well. Uh, like you need to pay off your living expenses. That's the, that, that is part of the beauty of the 50, 30, 20 rule. It is so um, uh, optional based upon how you live your life. But it, that's also can be bad for people that like rules and structure, like the black and white. And so uh, because of that, like, you know, people may not like that particular answer, but you could put it in one of those two categories, the 50 or the 20 part of the section. Very good. Very good. And I just want to, we're going to segue into another topic here, but I just want to want to mention, I received in the chat um, another really uh, nice comment. It says, when my husband and I met, we were residents uh, on the second floor of Wynn and uh, Syra was the RA. Uh, is really interesting. Thank you for the information as we're on our own uh, debt-free journey. So, oh, that's Sarah, funny. I, I didn't know you wore the RA hat. So it's, uh, <laughs> well, it was funny. I was, uh, I was working with a client one day and, um, this was a couple months ago and I know this is a little bit off subject, but you know, I was, at, I was telling them, I know we both went to Trinity. I just don't remember where we knew each other. And I was trying to figure out, you know, were we in a class together or, or what? And he goes, dude, you were my RA. And I, th- I thought, oh, well, that makes sense. And uh, whoever that was, I apologize if I don't remember you completely. I just remember I was just trying to maintain non-chaos <laughs> in, in, on the floor. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about, I'm really interested to know, you've been teaching a class for us, the personal finance for, I believe, what, three years now? Yeah, so I'm going to be starting my eighth semester here this this coming eighth, semester. Eighth semester, so probably what uh, eight times twenty five, uh, maybe maybe uh, two hundred plus students already that have have been through the class. Sure. And walk us, if you would, Cyro, step by step on how you teach, what you teach in the classroom, and and um, uh, um, I also want to just remind our audience, please, we've got a number of questions coming in. We're going to get to those. Please keep keep sending those in, um, and we'll address each of those in, in just a bit. Um, 
unless we see one that, that's real relevant for the uh, topic here. We got a number of questions, but Syro, walk us through a little bit what the class would look like. You talked a little bit about the uh, money scripts on the first day and how you see changes in those in the students on the last day of class, but give us what's kind of in the middle. Yeah, so um, step one, right? I mean, there's five basic steps that we talk through. Step one, and, and I mentioned this already, uh, but it's really worth going into, into a lot more detail. It's, it's understanding your desires and goals, right? Like, again, what are you trying to achieve? So in my personal life, again, what I based off this, the class off of, um, you know, I talk about, you know, the, the SMART goal that my wife and I set. The smart, a SMART goal is an acronym, right? So it's acronym being S is specific, it's measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. And so for my wife and I, it was, we're going to pay off $200,000 in debt by the time we were 30 years old, right? So it was specific. It's measurable. It's $200,000 in debt. It's attainable if we were made certain sacrifices. It was relevant for us because being debt-free was important and it was time-based. I mean, we had to accomplish this by the time we were 30 years old. And so understanding what you're trying to achieve is the most important thing. Um, and then how you look at it, like from a time-based perspective, can be uh, can be variable as well. You can do a short-term goal, which is something within the next year, a medium-term goal, something within the next one to 10 years, or it could be a long-term goal. So like how you think of time right, matters as you're trying to think about what are you trying to achieve. So step one, and I, and I tell the students this when we're going through this process, I mean, just really stop and, and think about it. And I mean, I pause for five minutes and let them write it down. I mean, what do you, like, what do you want to accomplish with it? And, and a lot of times here, I mean, we're talking about 20 year old students. I mean, they, some, some of them just want to have enough to go to, uh, to the bar or restaurants afterwards. I mean, right. Or, or have enough to buy the latest pair of, uh, of Jordans or, or whatnot. So those, the goals are going to be dependent on the life, the stage of life that these individuals are at. So that's step one. Um, step two, we talk about wants versus needs. And I go through this example and it, 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 it's, it's an example we all know the answer to, but it's, it's worth talking about it in specific detail. And I put a, a script on the board or an example on the board. Let's say that you get invited to go to a really cool concert out of town with some of your best buds, right? This concert, you know, it's, it's this weekend and you're going to have to hop in the car and you're going to drive over there. And, um, and, and you, you, you calculate the cost of going to this concert, the cost of the tickets, the cost of gas, the cost of eating out. And you realize when you look at your bank account, you only can make one of two decisions. You can go to this concert, but you're not able to pay your bills for this month, or you don't go to the concert and you pay your bills. And I asked the students, I mean, like, all right, raise your hand. I mean, who would go to the concert, you know, and then who would pay their bills? Every single one, every single one, everybody says it. And everyone probably listened to this, probably thinking, well, yeah, you pay your bills because that's what you need to do. That's the right thing to do. But when you really drill down into it, Here's what you really are, need to think about. Um, you're going to miss out on all the inside jokes with your friends, right? You need to realize that you're going to be you're going to be missing out on the social media posts. I mean, whatever the students are listening to or going through all nowadays. I don't know if it's Facebook or TikTok or Instagram or what, but you're gonna you're not gonna you're not gonna be a part of those. You're not gonna be part of the memories. And even if you do get like a souvenir from your friends you are, it's just going to be a remembrance for you of a sacrifice that you had to make, right? So when you're really understanding your wants versus needs, we all know we, what we need to do. Because again, we, we, we have that inherent feeling, we, we have that inherent thought process of what's right, and what's wrong. But understanding the pain that's going to come with deciding on what's what you need versus what you want is something you really need to resonate. So like for me personally, right now, I drive a beat up, Ford Edge. It's 13 years old. And my wife and my friends tell me all the time, dude, you need a new car. And 
And <laughs> I, what I what I really want is a Ford Edge Lightning. I really want that Ford Edge or that Ford, not, not Ford Edge Lightning, the Ford Lightning, the truck. I really wow. want that. But I have a higher purpose of what I'm trying to do with my money. I'm trying to save up for renovation for a home that could really transform my life and my kids' lives and my generations of kids' lives with putting money into a home. So for me, every time I'm asked, hey, don't you really want a new car? Yeah, I really know I want it, but I need to have this, this uh, I need to have a, be- a bigger purpose. And so I always think about that. And that's what I tell the students too. Like, you know, think about, again, step number one, what are you trying to achieve and realize that you're going to have to make some really tough decisions along the way. So we talk about that, right? So then, so, so all this, everything I've talked about so far has been really psychological. It's just been really just more thought oriented. And so we really haven't even gotten into the numbers yet, which I go into a little bit, you know, once we, we get over that big mountain and that's where we start looking at step three. And so step three is tracking your income, right? So your income, it, it can be pretty simple, right? I mean, it could be my income from my job, uh, but it could be, you know, it could have additional uh, things as well that, you know, may come in on a monthly basis. It could be uh, scholarship money. It could be the money that your kids give you or your kids give you or your parents give you as an allowance. It could be, um, you know, uh, uh, royalties from something that you have. It could be, you know, the house that you are uh, renting out. All that is income. So you track all of your income. You write it all down. So that's that's step three. Your monthly income, and you write it all down. All right. Step four, and this is where we get really even further into the weeds. And when we think about budgeting, this is where everyone gets you know lost, and it takes a lot of work. And and this is what takes a lot of time is you look at all your expenses. And when you look at all your expenses, there's two different categories you look at your expenses in. They're variable and you're fixed. And your variable are ones that change on a month-to-month basis. It could be shopping, it could be eating out, um, it could be you know those 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 items that just they're always up and down. And then you track your fixed expenses. And when you do that, these are ones that are consistent most of the time, right? So your your housing, uh, it could be your your cell phone bill, right? So you, you track all of those down. And so going through both of those types of expenses, you're going to have to go through your bank statements or your uh, your bank account uh, transaction history, and you're going to have to go and write them all down. And you're going to have to then once you write them all down, you you categorize them. And you bucket them in specific sections, right? So uh, your your housing can be one. It could be restaurants, and then entertainment. And and then once you have that information, once you've tracked all of your expenses, you then show for the past month where have you, uh, what has your total amount been, right? And then the um, the last thing that you do is step five, which is you just subtract your planned income from your planned expenses. So that's where you then understand, all right, am I underwater each month uh, historically? Am I, uh, by underwater, meaning that your expenses are are outpacing your income? Or do you have some leeway to spend more? Uh, What are you doing with that additional uh, additional money? So that's the five steps. Again, the, the step four is really where you dig into a lot of these details. Um, and, and that's where you have to massage it on a month to month basis, because again, the income part, that's pretty easy, right? There's only a couple of streams of income that you're probably receiving. It's those expenses that you really are, are going to have to, to narrow down. Um, that was a really long response, Bob. And so, I mean, I don't know if there's any questions when it comes to that, uh, but. No, no, it, 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 it. I think the detail is really important for us. And I remember you and I having breakfast a few weeks ago over at Snooze, and okay. you're talking uh, and using that methodology to talk about your planned remodeling and expansion of your house. And so that, that's a great example um, of something that you're looking for uh, yeah. to plan for in the future. So that's excellent. How's the, what's the feedback you get from the students using that approach? They hate me for the first month. I mean, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, 
and there's a there's a love hate relationship there the first month and and really uh, because they're going through the trenches right i mean they're 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 really trying to figure it out they've never done it before and again it's i'll use the example it's like you're literally looking in the mirror when you don't want to look in the mirror uh whenever you you, you need to stare at something and so uh it's frustrating uh whenever you walk through this process now after, at the end of the month, here's here's the project I give them. I say track it for one month, and um, just track your expenses. That's all I ask you to do, and um, and your income, and put it in the, in a in a shell or, or a document that you can categorize all of your income and your expenses. And it just at that point, write me up a one pager on what did you what were your observations, what did you learn about yourself uh, that you need to improve upon, and then more importantly. What are you going to do next time? All right, what are you going to do uh, the next month? And so the first month is the biggest jump that anyone has when it comes to their budget. It's, I didn't realize I spent this much at Starbucks. I didn't realize I go out to eat so much. Um, I, one of them was, I didn't realize I spent so much on my girlfriend. <laughs> like it was all these... <laughs> Like it, it's all these, you know, realizations that that it came out, and then I always ask them. I mean, think back to your money scripts. I mean, so how does this how does this tie back to when you first came into the class of how you looked at money? Okay, so that's month one. Month two, they have to do it again, but I ask them to put a a value or a budget. This is where budgeting finally comes in, right? You know, I want you to put a a cap on each of your categories. And now that you know what your spending history is, and so then they do the exact same thing, the write up after month two. It's what did you learn about yourself? Um, you know, what can you do better uh, next time? And then the last one is because this is the end of this particular assignment. It's a two month assignment. Uh, it's how do you uh, how do you sustain this process going forward without the accountability of me, a professor who's going to grade you and every Trinity student thinks their grades is like the most important thing in the world. So now that you're not going to have that pressure, how is it going to, um, how is, how are you going to keep yourself accountable? And, and again, the, the stories that I get from those, it's amazing. It's, um, you know, a lot of the students say that they, um, you know, they can't believe they've never done this before. Uh, this was one of the biggest realizations or every student needs to go through this uh, this process, um, you know, they've talked to their parents about it. They've talked to their friends about it. Um, it's, it's really great to see the progression of, Hey, now these individuals who came in here with very little knowledge about money and budgeting and psychology of it now are walking out of the class and they have a really good understanding of how, how to manage their money appropriately. And, you know, there was one sort, there was one student, I think it was my first or second semester. She actually literally got her credit card, her dad's credit card taken away from her. And then, um, and, and so she was distraught. And then she used this assignment after two months to turn it back into her dad. And then her dad gave her the credit card back. So she was pumped up about it. It was just, it was just funny uh, to have that little impact, that little, um, mm -hmm. nugget of impact on someone's life. Like that. <laughs> so, Saro, uh, great examples. Uh, uh, just I'm looking at the chat and we have um, one of our viewers, um, what I think is is a relevant comment, if, if you would address it for a second. Uh, so this viewer says, choosing between necessities and concerts is a privilege. And it's far more likely for lots of people to have to choose between different bills and other necessities. So if we acknowledge that, um, you know, different people are at different stages, different times, have different resources. Can you, can you comment a little bit about how you sort through it, um, choose between different bills? You know, how, how do you figure out, do I pay the electric bill or the gas bill or do I pay my credit card bill? Do I, do I, do I even it out? Do I try to talk to to, to the creditors to figure these things out. I think yeah. it's, it's a relevant, relevant question. Yeah. Um, you know, so there are, um, one of the things that we'll start off 
I'll, I talked to students about, I wasn't planning on talking here, but we'll, we'll dive into it. One of the first topics I talk to the students about is each individual, when you talk about money, is at a different stage of life, right? So the stage of life is, um, you know, for some individuals, like the ones I'm speaking to in college age, uh, they are, um, you know, they have they don't have the privilege of a job yet. And some of them have the opportunity to have money from mom and dad or, 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 or another individual. Then there's this other stage of life of, you know, you're a young professional and you're trying to rise up, right? You're in, but you, and you probably are starting with a family. Um, there's another stage of life is you're a little bit more established of an individual. You have a family and now you're saving up for college and, you know, cars and big expenses. And, you know, there's a couple other ones after that. And so at the, at the top of each slide, uh, throughout the class, um, you know, it is a reminder that each of our perspectives is going to change as we go through our own cycles of life. Right. So um, later on in life, you're going to have uh, a little bit of a different view of the example I provided about, you know, the, you know, go, have an opportunity to go to a, a concert. Right. So, so I think that's, that's so important because, you know, I'm talking to individuals right now. Who, I don't know if you're 20 years old or a hundred years old, you're going to have a different view of this particular section. So um, that's one, two, going to your question how do you then determine like which, how do you choose between which bills to pay and which ones are necessities? I, again, I think it really depends that let me first off say that it's no, there's no real right answer to that. Um, anyone who gives you a straight answer, they don't know your story. Uh, they don't know your background. Uh, they don't know what's priorities in your life. And I would ask that for individual. I mean, what are, what are, uh, what are you trying to achieve, right? Some people think that hey, turning on, uh, having electricity is the most important thing right now because my family needs it and that, that's going to be important. The other person may say, you know what? I don't care about the electricity because I can always go live down the street with a good friend of mine. I need to pay my medical bills because I need to stay alive, right? So um, these, are, these are really tough decisions. It goes, but it, it always goes back to what are you trying to achieve and the goals of what money that you have uh, and the money that you have coming in. Good. So can I, can I add my own observation? And sure. I know that there's a lot of um, assistance programs out there for folks having to make these kinds of choices mm -hmm. from, uh, for example, and I'm, I'm sure most of our, our viewers, uh, well, maybe many are from San Antonio, but we have CPS here and SAWS for water and they have many programs. Is it, is it good to consider ways that you can minimize your expenses with programs that might be able to assist you with your with your bill payments yeah absolutely and I, th I think the uh i think the tough part individuals have is that they don't know which path to go like how to find those assistance right and and that's where um uh that that can be the biggest gap right and so their google can only take you so far Whenever mm -hmm. you're looking in, in into those background and into like what is and is not available, and then also with all the cybersecurity issues going on, I mean, what's real and what's not real out there too. And um, you know, for for students, I give them my cell phone number, and so they can call or text me anytime. Uh, and if they if there's an individual out there that needs help and resources, um, you know, I'm sure to send your information here, and I can help find some resources for you. Um, and to make sure that you're pointed in the right direction, I'm happy to do that. And, uh, because I, I know people, right. That, that can help, uh, with, with that, uh, assisted stuff, or at least know which direction to go with the assisted stuff. Um, so, so yes, absolutely seek out as much information as possible, but obviously look at it from a, go get it from a trusted resource and friend. All right. Possibly some of the consumer counseling agencies and some of those might be relevant as well. I was, right. so we're going to shift over to our uh, Q and A session here, but I want to ask you just just quickly: are are there any key resources that you would suggest or that you use in the class? Is there a good book that you use? Or uh, what I really love is you're keeping tried and true uh, methods that we use in our business school 
for many, many years, experiential learning, project-based learning, which is, is I, I think, the best way for our students to learn is to participate, prepare a budget, think about it, um, real-life assignments. But are there any resources that you would suggest we consult or that, that our viewers look at? Yeah, I uh, so I don't have a book for the class, right? Uh, because I think a lot of this stuff you can, you know, find. But I, when I was looking at writing a book, because I thought, man, I've already affected lives. I think I can do this. I can write it. I can write all this down. There was one book in particular that I just thought had about 99% of the things I already said, but they already did the work behind it. It was a book by Beth Cobliner, uh, Get a Financial Life. I thought that was a fantastic book, but there are some really, uh, uh, really also great books also there that, that uh, there additionally, there are some additional books that have really impacted my life that I'll share with you. It's, you know, The Automatic Millionaire by David Bach. Fantastic book. Uh, it's all about setting it and forgetting it. Uh, all Your Worth by Elizabeth Warren. Um, it's a it's a classic. The Total Money Makeover by Dave Ramsey. I'm not a Dave Ramsey guy, but he has some really great principles in there and really makes you think. Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You talk about the psychology of money and like how you view money. Rich Dad, Poor Dad uh, by Robert Kiyosaki is, I mean, probably the book for that one. Um, one of the more, uh, the books that, that you could probably quote from, and it's, it's, it's a tougher read, but it's, it's really kind of interesting, especially from here in San Antonio, where, you know, it's a very casual atmosphere is the millionaire next door, which basically gives a bunch of t- statistics that when you think of a millionaire, they're not the individual who drives around in a fancy car. The millionaire next door is the one who's made a bunch of, uh, smart decisions in their life. And they probably are running around a beat up Jeep or a beat up car. Uh, that's a great book. Uh, and then I'll, I'll leave you with, um, Susie Orman's nine steps of financial freedom. Uh, that's a, that's a solid book. She's obviously used that book as a platform for her speaking engagements as well. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for sharing those. Let me, let me sh- uh, shift over to uh, questions from some of our viewers. And the first question, Cyro is, uh, how should we prepare for the upcoming potential recession and how uh, how can we be as financially stable as possible in a recession? So, so how do we prepare for that recession that's, that's going to be coming and um, what can we do to stay stable during that? So I think some of this is going to be talked about in your next session, but I'm going to, I'm going to brief um, on at least a few bullet points of what I what I talk to the students about. So I think let's think back to your budgeting, and there was two sort two two primary items. It was the income and then the expenses. So when you think about a recession, really we're talking about a cutback in uh, spending by GDP, which could potentially uh, create some layoffs from individuals. Um, you don't have as much money from your personal uh, budgeting perspective. And so the first thing you think about is on your on your income side is, uh, you know, is my job stable and be realistic with it. And I and I ask, you know, I, I tell students and I, you know, when I talk to friends, if you're in a profession that it's really easy to get a job across the street, right? Um then you probably don't have to save up as much as uh, in in uh, in um, uh, savings or emergency savings than an individual where it's really hard to replace your job. I mean, if you are a doctor in a specialized field, and you know if you get let go, then it's it's going to be hard to find a job in this city at any point in time. And so, be, but if you're realistic with yourself, if your job is um, very much as something that's easily replaceable for you, then your emergency savings can be, you know, smaller than an individual. If your job is not easily replaceable, then your emergency savings need to be bigger. And so it, when you, when you put it from that perspective, how you, uh, protect yourself from being fin- so to, to be financially stable, it goes back to your sources of income and how, 
uh, sure you are about those funds. And then, and then that'll allow you to build the cushion in your savings account, right? Um, also, when you look at the expenses, do you really need to have all the expenses that you have, have outlined? Do you really need to go to the movie theaters? Do you really need to uh, go shopping as much? And is there ways that you can cut some areas where it can beef up the income minus expenses, it can beef up those savings for you in a, in a quicker amount of time. So again, to help yourself be more financially stable. So I would look at those two areas, understanding if your job is easily replaceable, will allow, give you an indication of how much savings you need to have. And then look at your expenses to see what cut what cuts that you can make to so you can beef up those savings as much as possible. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Here's a question, Cyro, from um, a parent who asks, how should parents prioritize paying for their kid's college with other goals such as getting out of debt and saving for retirement? And the second part to that question, is there a healthy ceiling for borrowing for students and parents? So, so how do you balance those, um, those competing priorities? Obviously, we want to ensure that our children make it through, through college. Uh, and, and, but we've also got to think about saving for our own retirement and future. And then, um, is there a healthy ceiling for borrowing? Is there, is there a percentage or a limit or something that we should consider? Yeah. Um, these are really great questions. And so I, let me, let me start off by saying there is something called debt to income ratio that, uh, that's an important factor. So let me go into this really quickly because I think this will help shape the answer to this question. Debt to income ratio, it divides all your totally monthly debt payments by your gross monthly income and it gives you a percentage, right? So your debt payments being to, and, and count, your, count your mortgage into this and your car payments, et cetera. So uh, all your debt payments on the, uh, if you think about it on a, um, if you're dividing it out on, on the uh, numerator, numerator, and then all and then all your gross monthly income on the denominator, right? And so th this is, will give you a percentage that is important for you to think about, uh, and, and it's called the DTI or debt to income ratio. Anything twenty percent or less is considered low. Anything forty percent or above, it's considered high. All right. So let's dive in to your question, right? So is there a healthy ceiling for borrowing for students and parents? That's your ceiling, 40%. If your debt to income ratio is greater than 40%, then it is that that's that that's too high. Um, and so why is it high? Just give you a little bit more background. Federal Reserve is the one that created these uh, these statistics. So the Federal, the Federal Reserve, some of the smartest people in the world when it comes to money say that 40% is too high. It's good enough for me to say that 40% is too high. And so um, that gives you your, your ceiling. Now, the first part of that question, uh, prioritizing paying kids college and other goals such as getting out of debt and saving for retirement, I would use this as your guiding light. I would use the debt to income percentage as your, um, as your guiding light to see what you can and cannot accomplish. Because what you don't want to happen is overstress yourself at that particular point in time um, where any emergency that happens, uh, and you don't want emergencies, but they do happen. Right? A tree falls uh, in, in your yard that you got to take care of randomly. The uh, washer goes out. You get in a car accident. I mean, all these things happen. And so you don't want to stress yourself out too much when those things do happen. And so, so, uh, so prepare yourself by not stressing yourself out with having a debt to income ratio less than 40%. And um, it, it kind of answers your question, I think, sort of gives you some idea Then you know, I don't know, Bob, you tell me. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a good benchmark to use. And then within that, that 20 to 40% range, you can figure out how to allocate your different expenses. How much, mm -hmm. how much, you know, maybe this month, this this year, you put a little more into student student debt or helping your student get through school and then delay putting some in your retirement account for a little bit, whether you've got a 401B or a 401, 401K or no, very useful. Yeah. Okay. Let me, 
uh, we have another question from a viewer that asks, um, medical costs, even planned ones, can be a huge expense. Is it better to drain savings to pay it off right then or to take on even more de debt to cover those medical expenses? Yeah, that's a tough one because there's so many different layers when it comes to medical costs. I mean, you're talking about insurance and you're talking about hospital bills and, and all. Uh, there's a there's a couple of studies and a couple of really popular personal finance uh, speakers that speak into medical uh, debt and uh, and and I would it, and I'm happy to share some of those down the road. But if if you if you Google you know medical costs and relieving medical costs, uh, there are rules in place by hospitals where they can to some degree they help as much as possible. You know they don't they don't want you to feel like you know that that you that you owe them so much uh, that would give them a bad rep. And so I know they try to work as much as possible. Now, how you go about that, what qualifies you for it? I, I really don't know. So let me take this question and let me put it in a different framework. Uh, an emergency comes up, something that you have to pay for. And then the, and the question would be if, if you had this emergency, um, is it better to drain savings or is it better to take on debt to, to pay for this issue? And I'll go back to the debt to income ratio. Um, wasn't planning on using that terminology very much today, but it's a good one to lean on. And and I would go into if you add this debt to your gross monthly payment, and your ratio is greater than forty percent, then obviously you are going to be in a really tough situation and stressing yourself out on a month to month basis. So get to as much where you feel comfortable as possible in between that 20 to 40% range. And so, and, and that's your guiding like to how much to pull out in debt and the rest pull out in savings is how I would approach it. Now I say all that by also saying, listen, <laughs> everyone, everyone uh, has a different perspective and you can ask 10 different professionals and they'll give you 10 different responses. But that's where I would, how I would approach that particular question. I take it out of its context of a medical, and then I'd look at the debt to income ratio. Thank you. Sarah, we have one last question from a viewer. And uh, it's where or when does saving for retirement or other goals get addressed? And uh, my guess is with respect to the budgeting process, when does uh, saving for retirement or other goals get addressed? And um, is this part of the budgeting conversation or is it dealt with uh, separately? Yeah. And I'm assuming the questions from, from the context of uh, the class. So keep in mind when we're, we're going through a semester, I have 12 or 13 different sessions with a student, right? And in these 12 or 13 sessions, it's a, we're, we're, bu we're building a house is what we're doing. Uh, in, in, and as we build the house, again, step one is the foundation of like get to know your, your history and your past. And then step two is really the, the, the next step where we look at the budgeting process. As we think about retirement, um, as we think about savings, those really enter in a, a blended discussion of, of investments. And so that's a whole other type of conversation that we have, and we blend those together in. So it's a little bit further down the, the spectrum of, of the class, but we talk about it because every one of the life events that we talk about throughout the entire semester, uh, we go back to your uh, not only your money scripts, but also your budgeting. So Let's use your budget framework. Again, it's the income and expenses and, you know, the shell that you have. Okay, now that you have a new job, let's go back to your shell. And then how does it affect your budget, right? How do you affect your, uh, the information you have on there? Um, let's say you have a, a family. Now you have a kid or two, right? How does it affect your budget, right? Now you have a retirement uh, plan. How does that affect your budget? Because now if you put in a certain percentage of your income, into your 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 401k or 401b your income now has decreased so how does that affect your your budget and so we, we have all these different discussions about life events going back to the budget process 
Excellent, excellent. Just one observation from a, from a viewer. It says, "Great question." It, it it really is. And this viewer notes, Dave Ramsey tells you not to put money into a four hundred one k until you're you're debt free. And a viewer goes on to say, "The math doesn't really add up." I wish I had not listened to him and started day one out of Trinity saving for retirement. And you know, if I had to rewind the tape myself, um, I. I when you're 22 years old, you're not thinking too much about retirement. But as you get closer, as I am, um, you're, you're thinking that little by little, it would have been helpful to to, to squirrel something away. So that, that thanks, viewer, for that that wonderful observation. Uh, Cyril, any concluding thoughts for us? I will say um, one thing, two things. One, what a, a treat. It has been to talk to you, Bob, and, and and all the Trinity folks, and I guess all my RA residents back in the day that have all the dozens that I have, I have joined. Appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I think one of the one of the things I will leave you with is that it, it, when you think about money and you think about budgeting and you think about some of the questions we had about. Uh, the medical expenses, the these uh, borrowing, and and all what you're really trying to do is protect yourself in the event of emergency, which I know is you've got your guys next topic. Uh, what you're really trying to do is make sure that you prepare yourself for the future. And all that goes back to living below your means. And the only way, uh, and the other question was the recession conversation. The only way to live below your means is to understand like, you know, where are you putting your money today? What what are those means that we talk about? And so once you have a great understanding of that, uh, you're going to then be in a really good situation where you can handle a lot of these uh, unexpected, bad, you know, opportunities that arise here in the future. So um, thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Thanks for allowing me to hang out with you for an hour or so. And, um, you know, I look forward to, you know, any of the future, pro you know, programs that you have in the future regarding this topic. It's great, Sarah. And just one one comment for me is um, if you really want that truck, I've got a, a 2003 Ford Ranger Edge with about 175,000 miles on it. Okay. Just, you know, I'll be happy to <laughs> happy to negotiate with you. So uh, good. Sarah, so, great, great job. Um, we've gotten some more feedback. Excellent presentation from our viewers. Really appreciate alumni relations organizing this. Thank you, Salim. Thanks, Cyro. Um, yeah, really, really great feedback, immediate feedback. That's what I love about using Zoom. The other thing I love about using Zoom is I'm here at a conference in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I get to connect with you early morning here as well. I, I hope everyone's enjoyed this webinar. That's what the feedback's telling us. I, I've truly enjoyed being your host, and I appreciate the opportunity to serve as the host for the series. I have to miss the next one on the 30th, but I'll be back with you after that. Our goal in this webinar was to give you, the audience, our participants, our parents, our friends, alumni, an overall guide in executing and budgeting and spending goal for leading a, a healthy and happy life or at least a less stressful life as, as we move forward and, and, and really juice up our resiliency after the last several years. We uh, hope this discussion was helpful in sharpening your skills, broadening your perspectives. For um, additional learning uh, together content, including other webinars, podcasts, book club information, please visit our lifelong learning page on the alumni site. And now I'm going to just take a pause uh, so that you can look at that um, website there. We, we encourage you to go there. And also, um, here's some information for you about many of the other um, uh, programs that uh, Salim has set up for you. Our next speaker is uh, Cyro's colleague, also teaches personal finance for us, Mr. Raul uh, Rios, who's adjunct professor in our Michael Nidov School of Business. Raul will be here with us on Thursday, June 30th from 2 to 3 p.m. Central Time. So we're changing up the, the time on you uh, just a bit, but um, we're looking forward to that. And let me just say that I'd like you to have a wonderful rest of your day, wonderful week. Happy Father's Day coming up to all the dads out there and go Tigers. Thank you, Cyro. Thanks, guys.